All right, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, the partnership that Cisco's had with uh, Instructure has been invaluable. Just to just start this out, uh, I'm going to start off in my presentation just to give you a little bit of background about the Cisco Networking Academy. Because uh, how many people know about the Cisco Networking Academy? Quite a few. How many people have Cisco Networking Academies at their institutions? One, two, maybe? Okay. If you're interested, I'll show you a site you can uh, uh, go in and learn more about it. But um, Cisco, uh, basically, uh, Cisco Systems, about 16 years ago, there was a, um, a need to educate more students on uh, internet technology skills. One of the areas uh, that took place was there was a gentleman by the name of George Ward uh, and another instructor by the name of Dennis Frezzo. George was an uh, engineer at uh, Cisco and basically he met up with Dennis and Dennis you know basically had a need he's like an electronics instructor and things uh, but Dennis was uh, was well you know basically he's like uh, we have this need we need to wire our school we need to bring internet into our classrooms and George helped facilitate Dennis's class and and training Dennis and others about you know how to wire school get a router set up and provide internet access into their labs. With that, uh, George took an initiative along with uh, uh, others at Cisco to say, how do we formalize this? How do we push this out? And with that, the Cisco Networking Academy grew. Uh, we're now in uh, 165 countries, um, over 10,000 schools, and we've trained over 4.3 uh, million students. And it's not we training, the schools train them. We provide the education, the means, the curriculum, and the learning management system. And I'll just click through a few of these slides here. And again, uh, each year we look, we train about, and again, our system and our associates that we work with train about one million students. Uh, our education does not typically compete with training partners. Many of you may have people in your IT departments and things that may go to a week-long boot camp. If you all heard of those, uh, Global Knowledge and the others, you know, there's big training partners. We do not compete. Basically, we teach a lot of theory and hands-on skills. Uh, we are very uh, uh, hands-oriented hands focus. Uh, the style of our classroom teaching is uh, short lectures with a lot of facilitation and group activities because we want the students to touch the equipment and have a lot of hands-on activities. At the end of this uh, course, and again with our CCNA certification at Cisco, it's a four-course sequence which comprises about 280 hours of instruction. Uh, with that, uh, we do have uh, people that are teaching our program. There are requirements. They can't teach it in a condensed format. Again, we don't want them to compete with the training partners. We're in a different environment. We know that. Um, and again, uh, we just don't want them to open it up just free access. We want a controlled environment. And basically, when you look at Cisco, when I talk about 165 country, our um, um, outline, our global presence, you'll see here on the slide, I'm going to have to look at this again. Uh, we've got about 14% in, uh, in the United States and Canada, representing about 135,000 students a year. And you'll see from a global presence like in Australia, 19% uh, or the, uh, I believe that's the APAC area, Asia Pacific region. 19% uh, of our students come from the Asia Pacific region, 187,000 students, 19% in Europe, uh, with about 6% greater China, 5% Africa. Now what that means is we've got a pretty big network to support. Uh, my role in this is maintaining the platform and this is one of the things when we engage in structure to say, how do we build a world-class uh, education delivery system that can manage our institution's needs as well as delivering an LMS to, the, uh, to our students. And this is just an overall impact slide. You know, 4.75 million students trained to date. Whoops. We've been on our Cisco NetSpace uh, platform for approximately one year, where we, we've gone to production, gone live. We did migrate from a legacy proprietary system 
We've had over 1 million user accounts created in our system. Uh, our customer satisfaction is trending up. And again, with any type of change, I'm not sure if you've ever changed them. Well, I'm sure all of you changed your LMS at some point in time. You know, sometimes satisfaction, when the initial change hits, it's hard to absorb because everyone's used to doing what they're doing. And you'll see trending up uh, after the fact. So uh, it's evident here that, you know, at first people don't, don't like change. Uh, but now they're embracing the system and le learning how to use it more and more. So how do you go about building a world-class platform? What's the process? Well, first, Cisco, develop an RFP, okay? And again, I'm sure many of your institutions have, you know, or you participate in an RFP process. Uh, basically, you're doing a request for proposal. And I've participated in this plat area of, of giving all of our LMS requirements. Basically, what I did was I went online. I was a big, you know, I knew our proprietary system. I'd used uh, Blackboard. I'd used uh, Moodle quite a bit, and I was a big Moodle fan at the time. And I went out and I basically mined a bunch of other people's RFPs, a lot of universities and schools and things of that nature, from not only uh, universities, but also corporate uh, LMSs and things, looking at the features and things. And I basically put all those in a, a requirements area. Instructure responded to our RFP, along with several other. I think we had about nine or 10 uh, companies that responded. Uh, again, Instructure was the only one that came with Canvas on board. Everyone else was Moodle shops or something like that, you know. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. You, know, you guys are about third on my list. So I didn't know Canvas very well. Uh, but again, I, was, I always want to learn, so I was starting to learn the process. So we selected the top four proposals. We brought them back into San Jose. And again, the teams that came back at, you know, that were in our short list uh, did a little interview session. I think it was about a two-hour Q&A session where we asked questions, but, you know, the people that were responding to the RFP asked us questions as well because they're not sure if they want to do the business and commit to this, you know. So it's a two-way street. So I tell my students about interviewing, you know, because everyone's worried about answering the right questions. It's like, well, make sure you're asking questions as well to your potential employer because you, it's your turn to interview them as well, and, and people don't get that sometimes, you know. So an RFP process, it's a two-way street there where both sides are asking questions. So we did select Instructure, that's why I'm here, <laughs> uh, and basically we agree, agreed on a, a development work plan at that point in time. Um, at that time, again, Instructure started holding stakeholder interviews. The group I represent at Cisco, I'm in the Corporate Affairs Division, it's a corporate uh, social responsibility group. It's our give back arm in Cisco, it's a big, big philanthropic area. And so uh, things that are important to us are metrics, measuring impact, uh, marketing. Uh, we have various groups that do operational support. Every region is a little bit different. We have to abide by certain legal standards in all the countries that we operate in. We can't have children under 14 years of age participate in our program. 14 is okay, but you need at least be 14. Uh, so there's a lot of legal things that we have to deal with and, and other overhead. So then the development starts. Well, on this project, when the development start, scope begins to creep. Has everybody ever been on a project where you have scope that starts to grow? Anybody? Because, you know, all those questions aren't answered in that two-hour time session. And it grows, right? And it grows. Well, some of the challenges that we faced were we're replacing a proprietary legacy LMS. And our LMS that we had, it was called Academy Connection. I was around. I led our QA team. We hired a company uh, that was our first offshore. I'm not going to mention the company's name, but it was our first offshore development exercise. So, you know, it was more of a classroom management system. It was where we can onboard schools and create classes and give them access to assessments and curriculum. There was no collaboration for like student discussion groups, no assignments area in it. So I really didn't call it an LMS. I call it a class management system or an academy management system because it kept our structure intact and, and allowed us to follow a business or kind of a business process. We had training centers and regionals. We had a tiered structure because, again, we want to train our instructors, but we have to use a tiered and support model to do that in. The business stakeholders that I work with, and I've worked with a lot of fine people, so if anybody's watching this recording, I love you all back at home. Uh, but, you know, from our marketing to our operations teams and stuff, they only knew what, how, what we did 
with our current system, our old proprietary system. So the requirements were kind of stringent towards what they knew. They weren't open to explore new ideas and stuff like that and to adjust our governance models. Um, so you see Network and Academy, the business model is, it's complex. We have uh, three types of entities. We have Cisco Academies that teach students. We have instructor training centers that teach instructor trainers. And then we have Academy Support Centers, and we call those ASCs, you know, just acronyms. One of those entities, like if you're at your school, you may be all three entities. You may be a Cisco Academy, an ITC, and an ASC. And a lot of our instructor training centers are also support centers, which works really well but there could be different people in those roles that need a function. How do we put all this in and how do we make it deliver through our system? Also, we emphasized with, uh, with Instructure that the solution architecture needed to have a couple of key tools in it. Salesforce, you know, Cisco loves Salesforce. It's a, a, a CRM and I think Instructure is now using Salesforce. They weren't at the time, but I think through our efforts, you all had adopted Salesforce once you learn more and more about it. And again, as this company grows, you see the demand. Also, LifeRay. LifeRay portal is something that Cisco is using. It's used as our customer entry portal and, and basically the front end of our system. Okay? And um, Cisco IT. Now, Cisco IT has a lot of complex rules and about information security and, and hosting information and stuff. And there's a lot of red tape and a lot of overhead and a lot of meetings, a lot of documentation that we had to go through to get all our approvals in place. And I'm not sure if the Instructure team knew all of this when they came in and took on the project. Cisco's an 800-pound gorilla. Have you ever heard of that? And, and one, of our, one of our directors said, hey, we're either going to kill this company or we're going to them, help them be successful. And uh, there's the 800-pound gorilla right there. You know, who? Well, how do we overcome some of these challenges? Well, the engagement with Instructure, uh, Instructure brought in to us agile development methodology. How many people do uh, scrums and sprints and things of that nature with development? It's a great process. Uh, we were new to that area, okay? So uh, we did what was called waterfall development a lot. You know, very planned, very deliberate, quarterly releases here and there. And so this was kind of new to us, to start building something, to get a minimal viable product out, and to start taking feedback and making iteration after iteration to develop the product. So that was brought in. We didn't have all the resources to help supplement Instructure. So there were areas such as a Scrum Master. We had uh, Instructure provided through their professional services in the group, a uh, person that acted as a Scrum Lead, Scrum Master, for all the other groups. Because we even had some development going on with the Salesforce area that we had within Cisco that we owned and controlled. We didn't do all of it, but we supported that area, okay? Uh, QA resources, business, IT analysts, developers. Now, you know, do you think uh, Instructure has life rate development capacity? I mean, you got a lot of Ruby programmers and stuff, and, and guys are really smart and stuff, but, you know, they went and acquired and got uh, life rate developers to support the project, and where they had deficiencies, they pulled in the correct resources and put it in their model that made us successful to get the product out. And also working with Canvas trainers. So, you know, one of the areas I was passionate about is learning Canvas and, and I'm a self-starter. I go in there and learn a lot of stuff and ask questions. Because I came in to the project after Instructure was selected. And because, again, with my knowledge of Academy Connection and everything else that we did, it was helpful for me to get that five-foot level and work with the instructor team because they were talking to, with a lot of people at a thousand foot level and weren't getting clear requirements. So it helped uh, uh, push the project along. Also, there were some things that Core Canvas, you know, Core Canvas at the time, there's those little pieces that may have not worked with us or could have fit in our model. There was a willingness to change, not all, you know, it just wasn't saying there was pushback, but some things that we needed to have in place that you may not even know is in there just you know, how we deliver our assessments and how we replicate courses and how we want to lock attributes and stuff. Um, so there were some things that was actually developed and put into your all sprints and the Canvas sprints that supported us. So I'm sorry if you didn't get a feature because they worked on something of ours. But it was a very small area, you know. Uh, and they were also very open with communication expectations, which was really nice. But there were times when we went to battle, you know. 
I, there's a gentleman by the name of Ben Hutchings with Instructure, and this is me and Ben basically, you know, <laughs> or Matt Goodwin or something like that, you know. Uh, as I mentioned, the the account, and and this is one thing that's unique about us is we have our own Canvas Cloud, okay. We have over, I want to say about 16,000 accounts. And so if you think of each one of y'all as an account, uh, the Canvas instance, there's still some user, user experience areas. Like when I click on a link and I have to drill down through 16,000 accounts, it's difficult. I'd love a little filter to find a cat, an account. You know, just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, but there's, some, there's, there's certain areas that still, you know, it's challenging and stuff. So what was built? Uh, this is basically an architecture diagram that shows, and I'm gonna step over here real quick, so I just wanna point out some key features. Uh, Salesforce.com up here, that's, that's up in, uh, it's either Oregon or Washington. It's a, it's a cloud-based model, and you know, when we say cloud, these, these servers are in a data center somewhere, right? Okay, we just never see them or know which box it is or which machine it is. But Salesforce is up in, uh, it's either Washington or Oregon. Uh, Liferay and Canvas, they're hosting Amazon Web Services. Hope that's okay to say. It's okay, it's all right. Uh, but basically, you know, we're doing API calls between, you know, uh, state of Washington all the way back to Virginia, where we're hosted. And, and basically, there's a lot of traffic. Uh, so you'll see that uh, Liferay, again, is our central customer entry portal. Salesforce stores all of the information around our course offerings. We have over 150 course offerings. Uh, these courses have different versions, languages available. Uh, we accredit uh, users or instructors based on their training. And so those ITCs have the ability to click a, um, a check in, in Liferay in their roster area to actually accredit a user back up in Salesforce. So once that accreditation is in place, that user in Liferay, that instructor, can then see a course in a drop-down menu which then allows them to create a course in Canvas. When that course is created, basically they're just doing a check and, uh, and it's replicating. Because again, up in Salesforce with the offering, we store a template ID. So we have one of the accounts in Canvas that actually has all of our course, what we call our course templates. It's a course number. In Canvas, every course has a unique identifier, a unique number in the URL. And so basically it, it kicks off the uh, course copy API and provisions that course for that user set up and it takes a little bit of time. Now, when we started doing this in our testing, our courses initially, 200 megs in size. We had, you know, trying to do performance testing, we'd create about 100 courses right away. Well, I'd take maybe an hour for that course to show up because the job runner, and, and so we, we figured out, maybe we don't need to stuff everything there, so let's push some of our content out to S3 up in, up in Amazon. And uh, we got our courses down about 12 megs. Very efficient then. So we learned some lessons. Also, a lot of this API and response between Salesforce and Liferay, we're like, you know, some of this is a little slow, the drop down. So again, performance is another area that we looked at with this, you know, large beast. So we built additional Liferay tables. And these were all things that during the agile development, we were coming back and checking not only uh, quality of work, but also performance of the system. And then you'll see that we have a lot of other systems out here that we uh, use for SAML integration. And Liferay actually is our user store. And this is the, the way that we provide access into Canvas through Liferay authentication. And again, I can talk about our architecture later. So what resources uh, helped make the, this successful? Understanding capabilities. And this was key for me when I went on to api.instructure.com to start reading about what APIs are exposed and what could we do with Canvas. It's huge. I'm not a developer, but when I read through this, I'm like, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. And so when I would work with my counterpart, Ben Hutchings at the time, uh, or Weston Yowd, uh, or Carl Lloyd at Instructure, I would talk to him with this language. And I'll be honest, you know, two and a half years ago when we started this project, or three years ago, a lot of the employees didn't know Canvas as well either. So it was a learning curve for some of us as well, you know, because it takes a while to see what can be done. Also, the instructor team was very helpful, and this is a team at the time, uh, and you'll notice Mitch McFarland back there. Mitch is a, was the executive sponsor, uh, and, and I think Mitch was saying, and instructor was like, 
do we really want to take this on at this time? Because there was a lot of growth happening. But new people every week, still like that, but it was just really ramping up. So one of the things that we are still doing is with continued engagement. Uh, we work with our customer success manager, Hiram uh, Romrell. Hope I got your name right, Hiram. Uh, to continue our life rate professional services. Uh, Hiram, we work through Hiram for Canvas release management coordination. We try to take in every release that happens. Sometimes we defer. And when we have issues, like we've had an issue with our life ray upgrade lately, we deferred quite a few releases and we're trying to catch that back up because we like the features. Uh, we just finished a project uh, on WebEx meetings integration within, uh, within Canvas. Uh, if you are a Cisco customer and you have WebEx, um, the experience is very similar to how you do with Big Blue Button. Uh, because again, you're not going to probably run both, and Big Blue Button's a great open source uh, uh, collaboration platform. But if you do have a license with WebEx, we have Meeting Center and Training Center available. Um, also, we use professional services for uh, uh, the consulting services for how do we deliver content in the best way. So there's a lot of different things that we do. We're evaluating the course catalog to see if that's going to come through and, and be a tool that we could use. Uh, we're evaluating ability, and this is one of the things uh, recently I've talked to Hiram about is how can we lock down uh, an LTI object at the account level? We use JavaScript a lot in our system because we need to hide features because we expose those through APIs in our customer entry portal in LifeRay. We don't want people to remove students in the Canvas classroom itself. We'd rather come back to the course information page in our LifeRay system. And then uh, we still have a need, and if anybody wants to build this for us, it'd be great so I don't have to pay in structure, uh, but we need, we need the ability to uh, have a course, we, we have a course completion certificate now that's in our life race system, but it'd be great if there was an LTI app that would generate a PDF once you hit some, like, you know, how you can progress through modules or how badging works, that would generate a PDF document with the student's name and stuff based on a template. If anybody wants to take that on, I'll talk to you later. Kevin, you know, we talked earlier, right? Okay. Um, so one of the things that we did do is the WebEx Meetings plug-in. You'll see again with the conferences, and I'm going to jump through these real quick, so I want to jump to a quick demo and a little Q&A. It's so only have like six, seven minutes left. You'll see the interface is very similar to where, how you do with Big Blue Button. And then you'll see Type, you'll see Cisco WebEx, the second line, the drop-down. If you did have Big Blue Button configured, you'd see that there. So very similar user experience. Uh, but we also had the ability with an LTI tool to uh, put a little WebEx icon, so if you had any recordings or anything like that that you wanted to link to, you could click on that and access your we uh, WebEx recordings from your WebEx server and pull those recording links in without having to figure it out and copy paste and, and whatnot. So now I'd like to do a little quick demo, okay? Does anybody have any questions right now though, or you wanna just see it real quick? All right, perfect. All right, so uh, with the system, uh, um, Log in here. I'm not going to put in my wrong password. If anybody wants my password, my uh, it's like ten stars. And yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> it's nine stars, and this one's going to work. Yeah, you know it's all good like that. And that works. Cable's working. That's great. So basically, uh, you'll see a concept here where uh, if you only have like a student role, you'd only see something like the Learn tab, but for teachers, we give them more access, and if you have account management aspects for roles, uh, you can come in and manage and add users and add instructors to uh, your academy. Uh, but the teach area, you'll see here that we can just come in here, create a course. We can choose the account that we want to do this under. I'm just going to do this under a staff sandbox, and I'm just going to say test two. Test two. These populate the, uh, the fields for like short name and long name of a course. This is pulling back from Salesforce. Again, that list I was telling you about what I can teach. So I'm just going to do scaling networks here. I can choose a version, English 5.0. We also have governance. You know, this also does a check because of duration. We have a minimum days and a maximum days that the course duration can be. And so I'll just set this. I know I can. Usually if I go at least three or four weeks, it works. And then I can add other qualified instructors. And in this account, you'll see that, whoops, if I click here, there's quite a few qualified instructors in the account here. Uh, I can add more than one qualified instructor. 
Uh, if I choose, so I can just come in here and just say uh, Kevin Johnston and then save this. So I can add as many instructions as I want. Uh, what this is doing is now creating a, a course in Canvas, setting it up, kicking off the course copy process. At the same time, I can come in here and uh, click on Edit. And uh, in this case, you'll see that I have two instructors. This is pulling the course name and information. I can't change my Netiquette offering because it just created the course based on a template. It's just going to basically state what that is. I'm going to jump to another course, uh, test one here, because I've got some students in this course here. And you'll see that uh, I have the ability to resend an invitation if the user exists already uh, or, or if they don't exist in our LifeRay system that kicks off a welcome email to them. Uh, I can reset the passwords for users. Uh, I can also get certificates or letters. And again, these are batch jobs that were built based on the, the Canvas outcomes and the gradebook, uh, you know, but we built it, it's very complicated to set up and, and manage, but it was a process that was put in place because it was one of our you know, requirements because we like a lot of features, Cisco does. You know. uh, but one of the cool things that was built in was uh, various ways to uh, enroll students. Uh, one of the things I could have done is I could have just said, hey, for students, um, I'm gonna generate five seat tokens. And on a login page, if a student's already got an account or doesn't have an account, I could just pass out these little unique tokens, and they, and they could sit their class, and they could create their own user account, or if they already have one, log in with this and be enrolled in the class. So I don't have to look everyone up. It also can query my Canvas account and pull those users in. Uh, yes? I cannot at this time. I don't have one that's set up, and I wasn't ready to do the demo on that. Sorry about that. But you can talk with Hiram, and we can set up a meeting, and we can showcase that to you on a, on a WebEx session if you like sometime. For WebEx, it's a license, and basically uh, most schools have access to a Cisco account manager. Uh, we are working, there is a, a, something called uh, Free for Three WebEx services. And we are working to see how we can pull that in uh, within the Canvas platform. So if you want to host a mini session, uh, you can do that with up to three people. Okay? Any other questions so far? No? Yes? Uh, we look at page load speeds on, you know, for performance. In the U.S., we target around four seconds. Uh, in Africa, and again, a lot of these are last mile issues that we deal with. Africa, uh, sometimes it's under, I think we're hitting around 12 to 13 seconds. Uh, China uh, works well in some areas. Uh, some areas, due to last mile issues or the ISP with filtering and things of that nature, we have some challenges there. Uh, usually we direct our schools to work with the, uh, uh, their ISP to say, how can we optimize our routing? This is where we're trying to hit. Okay, other questions? No? All right, so I'm just going to jump into a Canvas class. And basically, the other area that with Canvas, you'll see that we do have theming and styling. It's a little bit different, OK? Um, uh, but the course, basically, when you come in and, you, and the course is set up, you know, you have to populate your students. You have to publish a course. Two key things to make content available. Same thing for us. Um, here, you'll see that uh, the course was revision. We have an area that we can launch a course. Uh, we have assignments. Again, our assignments. We have a proprietary uh, assessment delivery system. It's called Virtuoso uh, that we interface with, and therefore we do an LTI integration. Uh, the instructor team also supported our uh, development team for our assessment system in building that LTI service layer as well and gave us the specs because we're doing up to 70,000 gradebook passbacks a day sometimes, uh, which is there's a few, right, you know, uh, from our tool. Because we deliver, again, through, uh, I know there's, they're about to open up the door on me. Uh, but, you know, typically during final exam week and stuff, we can hit up to 80,000 assessments that are delivered in a single day, uh, just, you know, globally. Uh, so it is one of the things that we have to look at in considering performance. It's huge, very huge. Um, and luckily, uh, we did have issues, I think, on the gradebook passback at one time. We were having a lot of grades that were missed. We built in mechanisms to resend the grade. But then I think we realized that the API call was happening too quick. And so we put a little back off time in it or something. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not the technical guy. But they did something. 
and we might have one or two errors a day now that a grade doesn't get in the grade book out of around 60,000 exams, which is not bad, you know? But the student does have the ability to click on resend grade, and it gets in there from this tool. So um, again, I can talk more about it, but I think I'm out of time. But if there's a, other questions, and if you'd like to learn more, but again, uh, engaging with uh, instructional professional services would is a great advantage for us. We love the platform. Uh, again, there's still opportunities and areas that we want to grow in with the platform. Um, and again, that's why we're continuing this relationship with instruction. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Everybody still awake? Success? All right, good.